the lecture. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to situate us with respect to uh, where we are in the course. Um, you may recall that um, during our, our previous session, we had um, entered into a new module of the course. And it's a module that deals with uh, a fundamental quantity in the area of, of, uh, of age-based modeling, a fundamental uh, factor we have to deal with, which is, is uncertainty. Um, and uncertainty comes in many forms. It comes uh, in terms of uncertainty about parameter values. That's going to be a lot of our, our focus today, but it's going to follow us through uh, other lectures, such as on calibration. It comes in the form of stochastics. Um, that the fact that even that when we're dealing with age-based models, we typically have a model characterized by randomness over time. And even if we undertake the model, uh, in a, uh, with a, a given set of parameters, um, uh, we'll see different results each time we run that. We saw that last time. We ran same model, same parameter assumptions, ran it once, ran it another time, another time, and sometimes we saw differences in kind. Sometimes we saw uh, differences of degree. Um, so sometimes the infection didn't take off at all, or it took off quite a bit, but the exact timing of when it crested or exactly how quickly it went up uh, was a bit different. Who got infected first, et cetera. So the stochastic variability we have to contend with, that also induces uncertainty about results. And uh, there's a set of techniques we have to deal with that. There's another type of uncertainty which has to do with, um, in the context of a stochastic system, trying to understand kind of where we're at right now in the, uh, in the world. Um, you know, given that the system may exhibit a wide variety of, of, of possible uh, evolutional kind of um, uh, trajectories. In other words, it can evolve in different ways, even given the same set of parameters. Um, we're not quite sure what the situation is in the world right now. And if we have to make decisions about the world, it matters if we have a large group of people out there infected that we just don't know about, or only a small group, for example. It matters uh, for our intervention effectiveness. It matters whether there's a, a, a sizable group out there with outright vaccine hostility compared to just vaccine hesitancy uh, or inertia about getting vaccinated. And there's a set of techniques that some of you have heard me speak on from this floor, um, from the statistical filtering tradition, which combine machine learning or computational statistics techniques on the one hand with dynamic modeling, including agent-based modeling on the other. And uh, these techniques, provide us a way of kind of constantly re-estimating where we're at in the world. And then from that, giving us a basis for asking about what's likely to be coming over the next week. Are we gonna see a big outbreak? Um, you know, how successful will we be in our vaccination campaign or what have you? Um, and a basis for assessing the trade-off between interventions as the situation has come to be. Um, there's also the fact that often we have structural uncertainty about the model. Beyond parameter uncertainty, uncertainty about the, the specific values taken on by parameters. There's a bigger question, you know, about our, 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 the structure needed to characterize these dynamics we see in the world. We may arrive at a certain structure through discussion with system experts and tapping at the literature and drawing on previous models and you know explaining broad regularities, we may arrive at a structure that fairly well explains the data. But, but often there's questions about whether that structure might need to be changed or updated in the light of the newest variants. You know, is there 
a loss of immunity going on? Can people get reinfected? Um, uh, the, the choices from at this point, if that's not clear, it, it may impact choices at this point. And finally, there's, there's the issue of ongoing decision-making in the context of unfolding uncertainty, responding to a world which is changing over time. And where one option, for example, is just to wait and see, see how things develop and then make decisions rather than making decisions now that may, may be off kilter if, if things go a different way in the world. So this whole problem of dynamic decision-making, we may or may not get to it in the course, but all of these at some level are things that I hope to, to talk at least a little bit about in this course. And there's different methods for each of these um, in several of them such as here, the third and fourth machine learning plays uh, an increasingly important role together with dynamic modeling. Uh, decision trees can be used uh, together with dynamic models and computational statistics for this final bullet point. But today, last time we saw the first bullet point, stochastic variability, and we're gonna come back and, and talk soon enough about some statistical methods for for reasoning about that. But today we're talking about parameter uncertainty, uncertainty about, about parameters. And the key tool to use in this context is a tool that is well enshrined in the dynamic modeling sort of canon across different sorts of techniques. You will find it in HM-based modeling. That's what we talked about today, where there's some extra texture associated with it. You will find it in system dynamics, in compartmental modeling. And finally, you will find it in discrete event modeling. Yes. I just want to draw your attention to a question. Great. Okay. Says, how is dynamic decision making understood and incorporated into an ADM? Does it typically include a participatory modeling aspect such as using the simulation game? If not, put it. That's from Michael. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, uh, the 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 issue of making decisions under unfolding uncertainty, when, when what decisions are most sensible or most desirable really differs depending on what's happening in the world. Um, it's a topic um, that's been explored in a couple of areas. We're, we're one of the groups who have contributed um, a substantive uh, set of materials on that front. Um, and and the challenge here, and, and I want to I want to sharpen that before answering the question, um, zeroing around to answer the question. The challenge here to to to, to sort of um, clarify what I mean by dynamic decision making is that you know often models, Asia based models, compartmental or system dynamics models, discrete event models, often they are used. Um, uh, in a reflective fashion to, to assess, to investigate and evaluate the trade-off between different choices that we have. And so we might have a portfolio of possible interventions and we, uh, or, or a set of possible alternative interventions that we evaluate each. Maybe we combine some into portfolios that we, combined in, in tandem, but often the idea with these models um, uh, outside of the, the context of this last bullet point is that, you know, we're using the model as a lens to understand the trade-offs between interventions so that we can decide most judiciously um, which intervention is the best match to our needs. The problem that this last that the the problem that's brought to us by the challenge of dynamic decision making is what decision is best to make, what's the most judicious decision. The identification of that depends on the circumstances in the world outside of our control. It may depend on whether or not you know a recession occurs. Uh, or whether or not um, there's uh, another wave of the pandemic. It may depend in the context of West Nile virus where we've applied these techniques. Um, 
you know, whether there's a hot and dry summer, a hot and wet summer, a cool and dry summer, or a cool and wet summer. Um, uh, those have different impacts on the mosquito population and different impacts, therefore, on the risk to people of, of um, getting bitten by a mosquito that's carrying West Nile virus. And so it doesn't make sense to, to decide upfront, say in April here, you know, what strategy we'll use that we're going to engage in adulticide and, and fogging to kill off mosquitoes across the province for all of the summer. That doesn't make sense because we may not need it. Um, there's a good chance the summer will be cool and dry, for example, or maybe it'll be hot and dry and the mosquito population won't, won't get very high and we don't need that fogging. And it's a huge waste of resources and it's a health risk to engage in it. By contrast, if we, if we were to say in, in April, that we will undertake no measures and we get a hot, wet summer, um, like the summer of 2007 or 2003 here in Saskatchewan, the tropical summers, um, we may get a situation where, you know, a whole lot of people are infected by West Nile needlessly. Thousands and thousands of people are afflicted by neurological conditions, acute flaccid paralysis, encephalitis, and even uh, die from West Nile. And so what decision it's judicious to make depends on the world, which we don't have control over. And there's a need for a staggered approach of undertaking action, evaluating the consequences, evaluating what card the world has dealt, up, dealt us, and then making another incremental decision and making these successive decisions as we regard the world's uncertainty unfold. And again, one of the decisions is wait and see. Don't, don't do anything now. Just let's wait for another week and see what the weather is like before deciding whether we want a larvicide, adulticide, issue an advisory, or, or do nothing, continue to do nothing. So here we have these real options, these, these genuine choices that need to be balanced in light of the fact that we have uh, limited uh, certainty about what's going to play out and where that uncertainty has a big impact on what, what decision is best. And so here, this is interplay between observing what's going on in the world and these stochastics we don't observe, oh, sorry, we don't, we don't control, and, and taking action. So um, techniques in this area benefit uh, from two broad spheres of tools. Um, that we're both most familiar with. Um, and maybe I'll say three, because one is more general process related to Michael's question. So Michael asked about participatory approaches. And I would say that one of the most key needs for responding to this is indeed participatory in a sense. It's getting together stakeholders on an ongoing basis to reflect on what's happening and make decisions in light of the evidence in light of what the model is showing for the next little bit. So you have this model that's constantly being updated and you need people to be re-examining it, say every week. And that's exactly what goes on here with our bug busters meetings um, in, during the summer uh, is, is these weekly meetings to reflect on the West Nile situation, the mosquito situation, um, deliberate the alternatives and and where models can be key enablers for asking what if questions to to determine how do we balance this health risks of of adulticiding, for example, with the health risks of doing nothing, um, and how does that you know how does that compare with uh, engaging in a in larviciding, which will help some weeks from now, but not immediately. So here, bringing people together, engaging them with the model, having those discussions on an ongoing basis about the full situation is absolutely a key component of this um, making decisions there. And, and it's a human element. It's not just the model, it's the modeling process of ongoing deliberation. 
but there are two key, key constructs that are really helpful here. Um, and again, I could expand on this in a separate lecture if there's interest in this group. I, I, I have lectures uh, in this area that I've delivered, but there's two, two approaches to modeling that are really helpful here. One is to integrate modeling, dynamic modeling, with a type of, it's not dynamic modeling, but it's, it's modeling that's very common, particularly in the risk analysis area, and it's decision tree modeling, where you have decision trees. Decision trees explicitly indicate choices to be made, so those are the decisions, and uncertainties. There's two types of internal nodes on the decision tree, um, two types of kind of branch points on the decision tree that are different from each other. And then the leaf nodes, the sort of endpoints of the tree are consequences, outcomes for all these different circumstances. And it turns out that using HMS models or compartmental models or discrete event models with decision trees is highly efficacious for reasoning about this choice under uncertainty, because often the most desirable strategy here is not a static strategy. It's not a strategy of making one choice now and sticking by it through the summer, you know, that we're going to larvicide all summer. No, it's, it's an adaptive strategy. It's a strategy that nimbly adjusts what to do based on what's observed in the world. You know, for now, we'll do nothing. If the weather starts trending up, we'll issue an advisory. If it continues to trend up and we're starting to see more than a certain prevalence of, of um, West Nile among the, the tested mosquito population, um, then we will undertake uh, larviciding. Um, and, you know, otherwise we will wait and see for another week. These sort of strategies can be diagrammed out in a decision tree and the decision tree be, can be interwoven with a simulation model in a way that's very powerful and very practical. And so you evaluate this whole series of choices and events over time in the, in the simulation model. And an age-based model is very favorable for this because you can capture quite detailed policies, geospatial policies, say for West Nile virus. You can also, you can also capture the stochastics very nice in, in a very suitable fashion and decisions. Um, it does require in the model being very clear about where decisions impact it and where there are uncertainties. Uh, but a second method for, for engaging this turns out to be based on computational statistics and, and machine learning in the form of particle filtering. And here you're, you're again um, estimating the current situation on an ongoing basis saying, okay, given where we're at, given the likely situation out there in the world with some uncertainty, some distribution about it, you know, what intervention is best now? And you're constantly reevaluating your intervention choice given where you're at. Um, but what, what these two techniques, um, um, the way in which they complement each other is the decision tree technique will often let you reflectively say, well, look, if we wait this week, we can always decide differently next week um, and take into account the fact that my choices now um, can open up possibilities for choices later or close off possibility for choices later, uh, eliminate choices later, um, the possibility of choices later. And, and decision tree techniques have this very nice feature. So anyway, um, I welcome the interest in that. If if there's if there's serious interest in this as a lecture, I can deliver a lecture on it. I I've done that in this in my simulation modeling class before, and um, could make it responsive to uh, this HMAS modeling course. So thanks. I hope that's helpful. Okay. Um. So one of the biggest tools we have. Um, in our arsenal for dealing with parameter uncertainty is what's called sensitivity analysis. And there's all a swack of different types of sensitivity analysis. Um, many, but not all of them are shown here. 
Uh, so we can broadly distinguish sensitivity analyses, taxonomize them according to several different uh, axes or dimensions, um, uh, whether they involve just one parameter or uncertain about one parameter versus multiple parameters at the same time, or several parameters whose values we're trying to assess. Um, whether indeed we are looking at parameter sensitivity or structural sensitivity, where we're trying to assess how contingent is my model output on, uh, on the structure, I'm assuming in the model, um, the types of variation. So whether we're assuming fixed values for parameters or whether we're engaged in what's called Monte Carlo draws for parameters, where we draw them from a distribution. We have, instead of systematically varying parameters, say in a grid, increasing this parameter by 0.1 every time and that parameter by 0.05 or something like that. Here with Monte Carlo, we're drawing both of them, say, from a distribution, either univariate distributions, one for each, or multivariate, joint distribution. We're drawing each from this, from this joint distribution. And finally, um, there's a question of, OK, um, to what degree are you just drawing one value and using that for the entire simulation versus your, you're drawing a new value over time? You're taking into account that contact rate may differ over time or people's perception of risk uh, differs over time or people's um, vulnerability to stigma differs over time. So, so sometimes you, you want to capture kind of uh, stochastics with respect to parameter values. All of these are, are types of sensitivity analyses that are performed. Um, and I'm not gonna talk as much about model uncertainty here, but um, you know, structural uncertainty about the situation um, to, to sort of test how much our conclusions from the model are contention upon, hang upon the, the uh, structure we are assuming for the model. I'll come back to this a little bit at the end of this lecture. Um, but uh, you know, this is often an important question in the background, often on, on the part of decision makers, those who are model knowledge users. This is, a big question, right? Because they, they want to know, well, these results you're giving, I mean, would they be totally different if you assumed, you know, that there are fewer asymptomatics out there or there, or that asymptomatics transmit less um, or, or what have you? Um, no, that would be a, not a good example. But if, if you assumed that people can lose immunity or, or secure no permanent immunity, to put it another way. Um, so we're going to focus a lot of our discussion here on static analysis, uh, static sensitivity analysis. Um, so here we're investigating possible parameter values. So we're trying to assess how model outcomes, and I use that word decidedly because it can mean quantitative outcomes, but it may also mean trade-off between policies. Um, you know, how much does the choice of this parameter not only affect, say, the number of infected people as we'd expected over time? Maybe it has a big impact on that. Um, maybe this other parameter has a small impact on it, uh, given where we're at right now. But, but sometimes um, our interests um, are more in how much do these parameter uncertainties or, you know, our, our possible values this could take on, how much of them really change the trade-off between interventions, between intervention A and intervention B? Um, we'll, we'll come back to this point on a few times, but first I want to, I want to get us hands on. I want to, I want to, you know, enliven this a little bit by looking at an example. And most of you will have this example already 
on your computers because you will have downloaded this one. And in fact, the next one, um, you will have downloaded them previously from the course site during our last lecture. Um, and maybe even the lecture before for, for, for these. Um, so there's two of them. One is multi-clinic and say as hybrid saturation effects and lock-in version two. Uh, that one we provided last time. And then there's SIRS crowding disparities version 13 with stratified protected state space. Indeed. Okay. Um, um, so uh, I'm glad that's not my name. Spelling it out on the phone would be painful. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a look at these as in, uh, to illustrate this process of examining model outcomes with respect to static uncertainty, with respect to uh, the, the uh, changes in model outcomes induced by different assumptions about the parameters at, at the start and on an ongoing basis, just fixed assumptions. That's why I say static. They're fixed. They're pre-specified assumptions, exogenous, as it were. So let's load those in if we could, okay? Let's start with multi-clinic SAS hybrid saturation effects in lock-in version two. Okay, um, so here we go. Um, so uh, we're going to just recall that this model has people going through a set of states of infection, but one of the key points here is that the uh, treat uh, that that uh, treatment was necessary for recovery, so people would remain infective for a long time uh, if they weren't treated. It's only upon successful treatment that they become that they recover from infection and go back to a susceptible state. And in order to secure that treatment, they presented for health healthcare clinics. You may remember this; it's a rather visually evocative model. Uh, if I might say, um, and if we run it, we'll, we'll recall the basic features of the situation, but we have people in homes and, and those homes are ensconced in, um, in a broader context and some people get sick and they present for clinic to clinics for their, for their care when they are sick, but in the meantime, they may be, they may be spreading the infection. Um, and we have healthcare worker utilization on the top. And then we have the number of new infections here. And there is a chance that the infection will die out before it takes off. Um, and last time our focus here uh, emphasized the different stochastic outcomes that could come from a given assumption about parameters. But today our quarry is different. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the ways in which these outcomes are contingent upon the particular assumptions we have for parameter values. But it turns out our tools in, in this particular package in any logic are, are the same. We're using what are called parameter variation experiments. And without trying to privilege this platform, um, uh, you know, I, I want to draw your attention that these last that over here on the left in the projects window, you'll see a set of experiments. The experiments are marked appropriately enough with X's for the X experiment. And the final three of them have a little kind of tick mark that, um, you know, it looks like various, various ticks. It's kind of a triangular, triangular shape. Um, uh, and uh, each of these is, that distinguishes it as what's called parameter variation experiment. So over here on the right. Now, last time we had run a sto the stochastic sensitivity analysis. And here we ran the model 100 times, count them. But for each time, we just ran it with the same parameter vector, the same assumptions about model, what values different model parameters took on. 
each parameter had a totally defined value as given here. Population size, the kind of homes, the probability of treatment success, um, the, the, the fraction who are initially infected, contacts per day, et cetera. Those were all fixed. And yet there was some uncertainty induced uh, as a result, as you may recall. Sometimes it wouldn't take off at all. Sometimes it would take off in some quantity, the infection with uh, adverse effects on healthcare worker utilization. But here, our goal is different. This was using a fixed values for parameters. Here, we're going to use uh, values that change. And specifically, we're going to also use a good parameter variation experiment. And truer to its name, we're going to vary these parameters. Instead of being free form here and just drawing them from, excuse me, just using these values and, and it just stochastically varies. We're going to, we're going to instead vary parameters in this range uh, here. Okay. And you'll notice this number of runs is grayed out because here the number of runs is determined by this minimum and maximum. It's going to be starting at point two. It's going to go to a maximum of two with step size of point two. Now, having been up till 3.30 last night, uh, working my grant proposal, uh, I'm not going to do the math in my head, but uh, it, would, it would suggest something on the order of 11-ish or something, 10-ish uh, um, uh, possible uh, values. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, et cetera. And the point is each time we're incrementing by 0 0.2 all the way up to a maximum value of, of two. And this is specifically for contacts per day. Okay, um, contacts per day. So we're going to run this model however many times necessary to perform this stepping, each time with a random seed, that's what, that's what it says here. So each time with different random number sequences. Um, and uh, we'll see as a result, um, you know, degree of uncertainty that is induced. And I'm gonna say that with a star. Okay, so here we are. So this is the contacts per day. So we're gonna run it over this range from mere 0.2 contacts per day to two contacts per day. And you can imagine that might make a real difference if we have not just one contact per day on average, but two. In other words, if people in this infective state contact people not just once per day, but twice per day, or they, if they only contact them, them 0.2 per day, one every five days on average, 0.2 per day, then, then we're, we're going to expect that to have a big impact on how many people get infected. Let's see if our intuitions are borne out because sometimes with complex models, complex systems, they're misleading. So let's go run it, right click on it and run. And here it is, it's emerging and we're going to run it even as we speak. Here we go. Um, now, when I spoke with you from this floor, um, I, uh, last session, uh, I realized that at some point I was was either awoken at night or jarred jarred when resting in bed into realization that I I characterized this in an inaccurate way. I I said, well, you know, some people have more infections, some have fewer. No, no, no. This is summarizing across ten different runs. 10 samples, my math wasn't far off, um, despite my sleep, my fatigue addled state. Um, this is summarizing across 10 different runs, the outcomes. There are some runs that had a number of illnesses uh, per person in the population between zero and one here on average, and then others that, that had um, upwards of of, of eight. And similarly, here, uh, average presentation count and average illness count. Uh, here we have 
uh, graphs uh, showing the, um, uh, and I think this is, uh, okay, um, right. So I would have to, uh, okay, I, I'm going to need to investigate that more. Um, okay, here we go, right. Um, yes, so this is basically a, uh, okay, um, gosh, I, I should be interpreting this properly, but uh, uh Okay, um, so I'm, I'm not gonna be able to comment on that right now. I need to understand it better. But uh, here's average clinic utilization. And so basically there are um, some, I think this is basically indicating there's uh, some, some fraction. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Let's, let's go see what these are. This is embarrassing, but um, I need to go figure out the interpretation of these so I can say. So we're adding in average infection count, average presentation count, and average healthcare worker utilization. Got it. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. So we're adding in um, some contacts per day. And so these are pairs uh, of presentation count and contacts per day. Uh, so in other words, uh, with different values of contact, 0.2, for example, or one or two or 0.6, we have a clinic utilization that's induced. Basically, if we're below 1.6, we have very low average um, utilization of, of the clinics. Um, up to about 1.6, our average utilization uh, for the runs that were performed, which was one run here for each of these, of these, um, uh, each of these values of the parameters, we we got out an average clinic utilization over the entire run time, and for all below 1.6, it was basically almost zero, very little utilization. Once we get to 1.6 contacts per day, the situation dramatically changed. We hit a tipping point. And now we're getting massive clinic utilization where the clinic is totally matched, uh, mass, uh, totally, uh, uh, it's, its capacity is exceeded, it's maxed out, okay? Um, similar here with uh, illness count and, and presentation count. So here we have different values for the contact rate and this is the average number of times in the population people have presented for care at the clinic or number of times they've been ill. And what we see is basically there's this point, 1.6, in the value of this parameter, this contacts per day, this parameter that we're varying. When we hit that point, ba-boom, we get a totally dramatically different situation. You know, it goes from a quiescent situation with low, low clinic utilization, uh, low presentation count for people behind that, and low number of people getting affected on the one hand, to once you hit 1.6 contacts per day and above, you're getting massive clinic utilization, uh, driving that as massive presentation counts. People are going to the clinic frequently as if it's their, you know, second home. And then you, you have a, a large number of illnesses driving that, those presentations in turn. So it seems there's this, it's this tipping point, but, but I want to, I want to induce some humility. I, I believe very strongly philosophically and practically in, in bringing a lot of humility to modeling. Models are human creations. They emerge from a human theater and they are fallible creations. They are learning tools that help us, you know, advance our learning, um, but they are not the truth of the situation. They can more quickly debug our thinking about the situation, but ultimately they're one of many things we need to depend on. And, and we have to realize that these numbers 
while suggesting something big going on in terms of a transition point, a tipping point, they are themselves contingent. We're trying here to, to see how the model results are contingent upon context per day, but these results are themselves contingent because each of them is undertaken with respect to a single realization. We've run the model one time, ladies and gentlemen. And you may remember last time from this very floor, I, I, I walked you through stochastic sensitivity analysis and we ran this together. And what we saw in the stochastic sensitivity analysis was actually even with no parameter uncertainty, we had wide range of, of different outcomes. We had some runs where we had you know, about five, um, it, it, an average illness count of about five. We had some where it was you know, down here on four, a lot where it was zero. Um, same thing with presentation count, somewhere it was 80 and somewhere it was a zero. Um, uh, same thing with clinic utilization. Sometimes it took off and sometimes it isn't. And this was with, this ladies and gentlemen, was with no parameter uncertainty. This was the same parameters every time, but it was inducing these distributions of different numbers of illnesses for different runs in clinic utilization. These were not, these were not, I was misspeaking that these were showing different people with different amounts of illness. No, 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 this was, different runs. This, these were just running the model different times. It had different average number of illnesses by the end of the model that it occurred. So there's a lot of variability within a single realization. Within each realization, there's still a lot of variability. And we're layering on this uncertainty about parameter values. And you know, surely those numbers are not fooling us with respect to there being a broad tipping point. I think you know they're consistent enough that um, in terms of the numbers above a value, always having those those high outcomes that you know a, a state of, of you know tons of infections, tons of presentation, tons of clinic utilization, th those broad regularities are probably there. But we have to recognize that those individual numbers, since they all come from one stinking run of the model. One stinking run. Um, uh, it's just run one time for each of these. They were themselves contingent. So let's rep, let's let's fix that. Let's run it. Not 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 once per these. Let's run it ten times for each of these values. Remember, these are ten values. Count them: 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, etc. Hmm. Hmm. And. For each of those 10, we're going to run it 10 times over because the world is variable. We have stochastics here. Even for a given value of this, a given value of contacts per day, we may get a range of different outcomes, of, of, of quite a range. And we don't want to be foolhardy and rash. Um, we don't want to attribute just a fluke for one of these to, to being a structural regularity. So let's run it 10 times if, if we were, if we can. I'm gonna run it here, here we go. And let's, let's see what we get. So my computer is working. This, this little graph down there shows the cores working mightily to deliver on this task handed to them. Um, what we have now is, you know, a, uh, a very large number of samples accumulating. Right now it's about 40, but, but we're gonna have a hundred before the day is up. Um, and for a given, a given clinic utilization, that's the x-axis, excuse me, a given contact rate, that's the x-axis in this graph we're going to see um, uh, a variety of different outcomes up here. Why are these outcomes different? Can anyone say, why is there not just one value here? Why are there 
many values um, for uh, above a, a given line in the x-axis. Can anyone say here or online? Because of stochastics, Th these are induced by the stochastics associated with the model. We run the model with a, a, a fixed number of contacts per day. We can still get different outcomes, and those can affect the presentation count, the number of times people are are are, are seeking care, or the 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 average number of times they're getting infected. Right, and both of those are are impacted by the stochastics in the model for a fixed contact rate. But as you can see, there's some broad regularities here that emerge despite this uh, variability. The variability is not all over the map. It's not just entropically, you know, um, uh, crazily variable with no distinction for the results over different contexts per day. No, 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 no. There's broad regularity. There is a tipping point of sorts here. The values below one certainly. We see almost no evidence of, you know, illness counts or presentation counts worth beans. Um, but then at about one, it starts transitioning. By the time you're getting to 1.6, you know, it's very clearly established. Um, uh, even by one, it's, it's, you know, there's a substantial fraction of them that exhibit, you know, very high, high adverse outcomes. Same thing with illness counts, right? Um, here. Um, we have, or we're gonna have some with high, some with low, but what's not clear here is, is how the contacts per day affect it. Here we see again, the impacts of contacts per day, right? The, the sensitivity analysis. So we're layering in here, ladies and gentlemen, layering in on the one hand, uncertainty about model outcomes for a given fixed set of parameter values. Same set, same assumption about parameter values, we'll see a variety of different outcomes. Um, that's what we saw last time. That was our, that was our focus uh, during our last lecture. Uh, but, and, and that's related to the variability we see here for a given X value. But beyond that, we're seeing as we change the second type of uncertainty, as we change the context per day, you know, that induces um, these, these changes in, in these model outcomes. When I talk about model outcomes here, we're looking at three, clinic utilization, illness count, presentation count, three. Um, okay, um, yes, no, no. Uh, we can uh, see the uh, big changes here. Uh, for example, uh, we have a uh, zero article. Uh -huh. After uh, changing the expert, uh -huh. uh, we uh, change expert to buy. And uh, we can see these changes here. Well, well, okay. So there's a good question here. And the question concerned um, the step. Yeah. So so the student was asking, suppose we were to change this from 0.2. Suppose we were to change it, for example, to 0.4 or 0.6. Um, all that would Matt, all that would do if we change this to 0.6. So remember, because this is 0.2, we are transitioning from this minimum to this maximum with steps of this. So with 0.2, it goes 0.4, 0.6, 0.8. um so right it's not divided by six and so right now we have 0 0.2 0 0.4 0 0.6 0 0.8 right um we have multiple instances of each because of the in fact we're running 10 realizations of each but if we did a 0 0.6 we do 0 0.2 and then we do 0 0.8 and then we do 1.4 that's 0 0.8 plus 0 0.6 right and then we do two um but but that's all. Um, and so it wouldn't explore it as finely. Um, what do you think would happen if we change this to 0 0.05? What do you think would happen there? Well, I mean, it's not going to change the shape of the underlying curve. What it's going to be doing is 
it's going to be allowing you to explore this with greater resolution, as it were, greater detail, um, allow you to explore the, the shape of that curve. So we're running it here. Remember, we are changing now this context per day from 0.2 to 2 with a step size of 0.05. So it's starting at 0.2, and then it's going to, what's the next one up from 0.2? Could someone speak? 0.25. 0.25. And what's the next one up from that? 0.30. Because each time it's adding 0.05. So it is exploring this curve simply on a finer grid. It's it's more fine scale. It's it's examining it with finer sets of values here. It's not like it's um, you know doing a different computation in the underlying model. It, no, it's just trying the model out, as it were, with um, with with values that are more finely uh, finely spaced um, in terms of possible values of contacts per day. Now, this is going to have four times as much running because we did it with a step size of 0.2, and now we're doing 0.05. And so we, to get to the same distance, we got to take more, more steps, right? If I go with a larger step size, I'll go quickly. If I go with a small step size, well, I, I'll, I'll illustrate it from this way because people won't be able to see it. If I go with a small step size, you know, it'll take a while, right? I'll have to take many steps. But, um, you know, what, what it, we're rewarded by is going to be a richer picture of what's going on. Um, it will be a picture that's going to take a while to complete, to fill in this picture. Note that this top one is just a histogram over illness counts. And it's illustrated across all runs that were performed, regardless of contacts per day, regardless of which of them are from just variability within a given context per day. We're showing, you know, the average um, average number of illnesses. This one down, these ones down below are going to be more, more meaningful. And what you see there, um, there's a uh, plug so for uh, mumble. Oh, there's a plug back there. Yeah, there's a plug back there. This some great plugs. Um, this room is is plug equipped. Um, uh, okay, uh, so I don't think we'll we'll wait till all of this finishes, but you'll notice that we are now exploring this grid in in greater detail, and you can see uh, spoken to us by this lower curve as well as uh, this curve on the presentation count, quite a steep escalation. Something happens around one contact per day that makes it a lot more likely to have an adverse situation catch. More illnesses, more presentations, higher utilization of the clinic. And it's a pretty steep, it's a pretty steep escalation that occurs right around that point where contacts per day are equal to one, okay? Um, okay, so we've looked at sensitivity analysis with respect to one parameter value here. And we found that we have to be cognizant in interpreting the results on the fact that the model's itself stochastic. If we were to hang all our hat on a single realization result from for, for you know the model outcome from a single uh, run for a given contact rate, we could fool ourselves. You know, we could say for one, it's just this one down here, for example, or even this one down here, and we'd miss the fact that at one there's a particularly ebullient, a particularly rich, a particularly diverse set of different outcomes that occur at contact rate one. Uh, below that, you, what you're dealing with is small potatoes in terms of average illness count presentation, count clinic utilization. It's basically essentially zero below that. At one, 
you see a huge variability in, in, in outcomes uh, along different measures. Um, uh, and above one, you go to a situation where, again, it's less diverse that, that uh, you, you get as contact rate goes up, increasingly, it's a given that you're going to have very large um, numbers of, uh, uh, of, of infections, presentations, and average clinic utilization. I think it's actually removing dots here. I think this is, I, I think uh, these graphs were set up um, uh, quickly and uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll provide better ones for you. The problem is we, I think, did not have the, um, uh, the storing all the values that they, really should have and um and i'd have to go figure out where it is wade would probably the other data sets not, not the histogram oh okay so the other ones further down the editor the, above the, the scatter plot. uh these ones here yeah like the blue air oh i see yeah about to 100 latest yeah so so i'll make it ten thousand. um so for each of these uh and then we'll We'll see. It was throwing these things out. Um, it tends to be a bit penny wise and pound foolish, any logic. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it throws out a lot of samples, but, uh, you know, unless you, you said it otherwise, but it, it's a bit of a resource hog in terms of other things. Anyway, um, you, can, you can run these, but let's, let's go on to another need here because we've only been examining outcomes with respect to one parameter. And in general, we have more than one, right? Um, so, um, you know, we, we could look at contacts per day. We could look at incubation and incubation time and days, for example, in isolation. But often we're gonna be interested in how do those interact? And to explore this more, I would like to go to our other model that we're gonna be looking at. I'm gonna leave this, running because I'm, I'm interested in showing you the results. But we're going to go to this other model. So uh, you can close this one. I'll leave it open. But the other one is this model, SIRS crowding disparities version 13 with stratified projected state space. Okay. Um, and the name suggests a topic to which we will repair um, or which we will encounter with which we will engage later in the course. Um, but but for now, I, I want to pay attention to this model in as much as it exhibits a multi-way sensitivity analysis. And meanwhile, we, we see this um, uh, this picture emerging like we saw last time, but we're going to keep these ones uh, below one to get a sense there. Okay, so this SIRS crowding disparities version 13, let's open that and let's go to the, um, to some of these, you'll notice these are parameter variation experiments here with these kind of little um, uh, uh, tick marks or, or sort of triangles or uh, whatever it is, uh, pointers. Um, okay, now, um, uh, this uh, is going to be uh, a model that exhibits two, two sort of different approaches that I haven't talked about. The first of them should be more familiar. It's a multivariate exploration of a grid. So in this model, I'll, I'll just remind you here, we have a sort of bog simple SIRS model. People can go, they can get infected from each other in networks. They can recover and then they can lose immunity um, after some period of time. Um, this Monte Carlo parameter variation grid, as its name would suggest, examines bivariate, like in other words, changing two parameters, uh, the outcomes. Um, that is, how do outcomes vary with respect to duration of immunity and duration of infection? Uh, uh, we see that here. Um, so we're going to here 
in the same, by the same general approach we did previously, for duration of immunity, we'll go from a minimum value of 30 days to a maximum value of 75 days with a step of 15. So that will rise 30, 45, 60, 75. Right. Okay, so here we have a, a, a set of values that are induced, um, and uh, that's going to be four values, 30, 45, 60, and 75. And then duration of infection will go from 5 to 20 with a step size of 1, okay? Um, and so it'll be 5, 6, 7, 8, et cetera all the way up to 20, okay? Um, and, and so we should have 16 if, if, if um, and the calculation serves me now. Um, uh, so so we'll, we'll go from five to 20 inclusively with a step size one. And we're gonna, what's novel here is we're gonna look at these two together. So we're gonna vary them in the range multivariately and this to, this also is a stochastic model. Um, it's a, as most Asian based models are, it is stochastic. And so we would do well to examine these with respect to not just one realization, not just running it once for each, whose results might be just a fluke, but 10 times, 10 times over, we're gonna run this for each of these combinations. Four with respect to the first, I think 16 with respect to the second. So that's 64. Um, and uh, and then we'll we'll do so uh, with respect to this 10 here. So so that would be 640. Um, uh, okay. Um, so that's uh, that's the overall uh, plan here. Now, just to to give you that picture of what this looked like when we weren't throwing out points. Here we have um, this picture filling in as to how uh, average illness duration down here, uh, average presentation town, that's in green, and uh, in this clinic utilization vary with contacts per day. And you start to see a richer picture where you know, the, the risk of a higher, of, of serious outbreaks really starts to rise a little bit below one, one contact per day. Um, but at one contact per day, you have this huge variability and maybe at 0.8 uh, or 0.95 per day as well. Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna leave that. I think we'll stop that so I can run this other model, but it is indicative of a, of a uh, a kind of uh, tipping point, which we've identified through sensitivity analysis. We might not have known about this, just how steep it is, where this transition occurred, just how the default value one just happened to be on this cusp of, of, uh, of where this transition occurred if we hadn't performed the sensitivity analysis, okay? Um, Okay, uh, so let's let's go and I'm gonna stop this and let's go run this other one. So um, um, so here we're doing this multivariate grid, varying one over four possible values, other over 16 each time, running at 10 times. There we go. And we're gonna be looking at incident case count. And unfortunately, the um, this is the one that's beset by the orange menace. Um, uh, and you, you can kind of barely make it out, unfortunately, but there's kind of a, a fringe uh, up here so far um, as we are, are varying these. Um, and uh, you can see, you can see it. Kind of, oh, it actually finished. Okay, that's... That's uh, mumble. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, that that's curious. Why would it have finished that? Um, okay, um, that is puzzling. Um, 
okay. Uh, any any thoughts? Okay. Stop at specified time up to time a thousand, but it's showing it as complete. Um, it's only running it once. Okay, so um, hmm. Well, I'll be. Um, any any thoughts about what's going on from any students? Um, that is. Uh, that is odd. It should be varying each of these over this range. I don't see any specific problems. Okay. Um, uh, students seem to like it when I debug things, so I'm going to debug this. Um, so we're going to try uh, a parameter variation. I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to paste it. And one good principle when you're debugging things is copy so you don't screw the original up as you try to poke around and figure out what it is. Uh, I'm going to say uh, univariate, Monte Carlo parameter variation grid. And I'm going to change one of these to be fixed. Uh, without prejudice, it'll be this duration of immunity. There we go. We're going to just change the, the duration of infection from 5 to 20 with a step size of 1. Um, and we'll we'll try this and let's see if it uh, okay so this one also finished quickly okay um so it did run it for a uh a bunch of these okay um hmm. um so it's it's possible the other one actually did get run um Let's see. So is this one actually running? Let's let's go see if it's running. Um I uh, okay, yes, it is running. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's just running super quickly. That's the issue. Okay. Um so it's running, it's running all of these combinations. If we were to change this to um well, we can't change the, well, we could change the number of replications. Uh, if we were to change it to 100, it's going to take a lot longer to run. And, and it will, uh, we'll, we'll see it running for, for longer here because each of these possible parameter values, it's going to, to run at once. Here, we're, we're not getting a, a particularly, helpful output. It's just kind of glomming them all onto this. And unfortunately, the color scheme is such that it's not that helpful. So I think what I'm going to do is replanning. I'm going to go up to that previous model we had where we had a, a kind of nicer. Yes, Wade. May I contribute? Uh, Absolutely. Your, your population size is 100. Uh-huh. Uh, grid, while as the other baseline uh, the baseline is a thousand got it okay and this is 250 and um and uh large okay yeah so that that could be certainly a contributor to it um so thank you i will i will go uh change population size to it to a thousand thank you um and each of those will have more substance but I, I think we probably want to get to the other model anyway, because this one is just not very effective at visualizing the results. Oh, but now you do see, well, you can't see it that well, but on my screen is kind of a, a bit of a band up here um, of orange. Just it's, it's it was visible more before, and then a, a low one down here indicating infection that didn't take off. But because it's more effective, I think I'm going to look up here and I will combine these two. So contacts per day, sensitivity analysis and incubation period sensitivity analysis, we're gonna combine. So incubation period goes from uh, zero to 21 days with a step size of, of one. Um, I think I'll change it from a minimum of one um to steps uh to to 21 with a with a step size of one contacts per day so i'm going to copy this 
I'm going to paste it in here. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to say multivariate. There we go, multivariate, good. And I'm gonna make an incubation period, the incubation period in days go from one to 21 with a step size of one. There we go. So now we're varying them together. And for each of them, I'm gonna run it 10 times with a random number seed, and it's running it for a substantive time with a sizable population. So I'm gonna run it here and we will observe the outcome in terms of these familiar metrics. So I'm varying two parameters now. Um, I'm actually only showing them with respect to, to one. So this, this is still context per day, but now we're varying the, the duration of immunity, uh, incubation period rather. And so we're gonna see a lot more variability when our step size, excuse me, our contacts per day are less than one. Because sometimes our incubation period is gonna be longer, sometimes it's gonna be shorter. And it turns out that will make a difference in terms of some of the results. But as it grows to, to greater than one, we're, we're gonna see the potential for much, much higher much, much higher values. So as contacts per day grows to above one, we'll see the, the possibility of much, much higher illness counts, presentation counts, et cetera, on average. And uh, that's going to, that's going to rescale this graph in a way that is going to make those uh, uh, be variable. But again, we'll see even above one, we're going to see quite a bit of variability. Um, uh, you can see it down here in clinic utilization. There are some runs above uh, whose contacts per day are above one, which exhibit less um, uh, less clinic utilization. Uh, uh, and there's many that observe uh, that exhibit high amounts. So I won't run this, but here I won't run this for for its entirety. But here we're seeing varying two parameters at the same time, projecting it down into just uh, a function of one, how does that change uh, the outcome? Well, now we have these two sources of parameter variability and we're examining all combinations of them. But another thing I want to show from the other model, the model we, we kind of um, uh, shunted aside there after examining it, was uh, this one. So there's something called Monte Carlo. And in fact, this, this shouldn't say, this new one I introduced shouldn't say um, grid, uh, Monte Carlo. It should say parameter variation grid in there. Okay, Monte Carlo parameter variation. So here, rather than stepping a parameter, we're drawing a parameter value from a distribution. In, in this case, it's a truncated normal distribution. Um, so in other words, uh, the duration of infection here has a minimum value of zero. Um, otherwise, it's drawn from a normal distribution with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of two. Believe it or not, any logic estimate that order. So standard deviation is the first, standard deviation is two, the normal distribution is 10. Normally the normal distribution has negative support. In other words, it, it has some non-zero probability of being less than zero, but we truncate it at zero for that. We, we don't allow value less than zero. And that's that we say max. Um, and so if it's less than zero, the max of zero and this value of less than zero will be zero. By contrast, if the draw from the normal distribution is more than zero, uh, we'll use that, that value. If it is zero, that's zero. Um, okay, uh, so here we are, we are examining the consequences of running this model with uncertainty about this parameter, with varying this parameter duration of uncertainty, a duration of infection. But instead of systematically varying it over a grid or over you know fixed interval by stepping it 
by a certain amount, stepping about by 0.2 every time, from 0.6 to 0.8 to 1 to 1.2. Instead, we're drawing its value from a distribution. And then we are observing the induced distribution, the induced distribution for the model outcomes. So let's let's see that if we could. Um, I because this is such a poor visualization, though, I want to take this, I'm going to double click and copy it, and we're going to transport it to the model above because it's this model gives us such a better way of, of sort of showing this. So I'm going to take this incubation period per day, um, uh, you know, uh, context per day and parameter variation, and I am going to copy it. Actually, we, I'm going to copy the one which we already changed to have uh, a larger number. Do we, we already did it. Okay. So I'm, I'm, uh, which one did I do it for? Was it stochastic sensitivity? No, um, it was one of these. Um, uh, it was for, must've been the contacts per day one. Here we go. Contacts per day. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to copy this, right click on it, copy it, right? And then paste it, right click on the whole model, paste it. So we get all its settings, but we're going to go in there. We're going to change this, this context per day. We're going to change it to be, first of all, do this free form instead of varied in range. We'll tell it to run it for 100 realist, 100 draws of parameters. Each of those draws will be run 10 times. This number of replications or realizations per, per iteration. This will be 100 iterations, 100 draws. Okay, and we're going to draw the, let's say the context per day to be from a max of zero and a draw from a normal distribution with log standard, or excuse me, standard deviation 0.1 um, and a, uh, a mean of one, okay? So here we have a normal distribution for contacts per day, except it's truncated on its lower side. It's truncated so it doesn't go below two. Um, and if it, if we get a value less than zero, we'll use it. Okay. So, so here we'll have a mode, the single most likely value will be one, it turns out. And, and then there'll be some chance we'll get 1.1 and some chance will be 1.2. Um, 95% of the values, um, will lie within two standard deviations on either side of, of one. So between 1.2 on the upper side and 0.8 on the lower side, 95% of the values will lie. Um, but there'll be some below that. So let's, let's run this, okay? So here we're drawing for each of 100 iterations, as they're called, 100 draws from this, and then each of those is gonna be run 10 times to capture the effects of stochastic variability. The fact that there's happenstance even for a um, for a, a fixed set of parameters. So I'm gonna call this um, Monte Carlo contacts per day parameter variation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's run it. We're giving you a good run for its money every time with, with a stop time of 10,000 folks. Okay, let's let's run it. Okay. And we will and and we are seeing the graph here. Uh, this again is an XY plot. The one is above is just a histogram, not as interesting. 
The one below is an XY plot, context per day on the X axis, average clinic utilization here on the Y. And now we're drawing these values of context per day from a, a distribution. You can kind of see they're, they're more peaked. Um, they're more common in this kind of range between about 1.1-ish one and 0.75 or something like that. We're seeing a, a lot of them, but there's also some, yeah, 1.2, kind of as you'd expect. If they were kind of normally distributed, truncated normal. Um, but you'll notice that, that these ones that are further out to the right, higher, higher clinic utilization, where we're drawing it from a value that happens to be higher, they have a, a, a context per day. They have higher clinic utilization, right? Um, and they have higher average illness counts as well. Um, so the average presentation count is also much higher here. Um, so we're getting induced distributions on the outcomes. Um, so you could say we fed in a distribution for contacts per day. We kind of fed that into the model and out pops a distribution on average presentation count, for example, with some values being higher and some lower. Uh, a distribution for average clinic utilization, some higher and some lower. And what we see is that it's exceptionally sensitive in this region around one. You know, if um, the context per day is well below one, it's really not that sensitive to a small change in that. But around one and, and a little bit higher, um, it tends to really escalate in terms of the dynamics of the situation. We get into this mode of, of being topsy-turvy, a huge number of people getting infected, needing care, presenting for the clinic, and maxing out the clinic, people going home without being seen, infecting them. Um, and uh, the average illness count here is, is, is reflective of this transition, as is this, uh, this presentation count. So this pattern was hidden in this model. We didn't, this is an emerging pattern, just as much as patterns over space or over, over time are, or over networks. There was this latent potential here. Sensitivity analysis allowed us to identify it allowed us to look as we alter parameter values, how does the model respond? And we've, we've identified a tipping point, uh, a tipping point uh, where there's this qualitative change from one mode, kind of a low, low clinic utilization, fast treatment, low, low um, number of people staying infected for long, low number of presentations, low numbers of infections. On the one hand, to a situation of constant firefighting, you know, having massive numbers of people uh, getting infected, needing care, going to the clinic, waiting for long times, balking, et cetera. A qualitative difference um, revealed through, through sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis can help help us identify these, these latent tipping points. They can help us identify these parameters where it really matters. Um, and uh, you could be excused for, for wondering, you know, which other of these parameters, like the incubation period of duration of infection might or might not have such tipping points with respect to them. Okay. Um, so, um, so we've explored some aspects of, of the AnyLogic uh, interface. One thing I didn't really stress, but um, is explored by another model, this SIR agent-based calibration, um, is the fact that as we vary parameters, you know, we're, what's, what's inducing is different trajectories of model outcomes over time. Um, I'd invite people to follow this. I'm not gonna open it up now for lack of time, but if we were to 
run this model and I, I give some suggestions here for this. Um, you know, like make a modification for the average illness duration, putting it in a certain region and varying it in a range and viewing the outcomes. What you'll see is as you vary that parameter, um, systematically you'll tend to get more infections as you have a longer average illness duration. The dynamics of the infectious population over time, the count of infections, is reflective of changes in the parameter. As you have a larger illness duration, you'll tend to get a higher peak and, and then a longer time until it really uh, dies down. Um, and, you know, in the slides, I examine multi-way sensitivity analyses. Now, what we'll talk about next time is a big challenge that comes up here. We've seen this for two parameters, but, you know, if you have three or four, or five, you're going to have this combinatorial explosion of, of possibilities. And um, you can go at that in a brute force way. There's nothing to prevent you from running it overnight as you're varying parameter values. Uh, but it's, it's often helpful to really explore the space judiciously to think about using some other techniques. And there's really three techniques that can benefit us in this regard. Uh, dimensional analysis allows us to reduce the number of parameters that we need to vary. Um, we might go from five parameters to two that we need to vary, two dimensionless parameters. There's another set of techniques uh, based on uh, Latin squares and based on orthogonal arrays, which basically judiciously select combinations of parameter values to undertake. And the idea here is you, you can undertake the analyses with fewer possible combinations and more thoughtfully chosen combinations and examine the outcomes with respect to those um, and spend more time reflecting on those outcomes. Um, and then uh, we've been just seeing now some Monte Carlo techniques, which turn out to be much more scalable as well. Um, they're not as judicious uh, as, as these techniques for thoughtfully selecting combinations or dimensional analysis, uh, which in some ways is the most thoughtful of all, but they provide ways of, of, of addressing this curse of dimensionality. But in my closing moment for today, I, I just want to, to get you to, um, to reflect on a couple of things. And then we'll close and we'll come back to this topic next. So first of all, I, I think I've tried to emphasize in this lecture, and I think I've done, done it, you know, some added some value, that in stochastic models, like we typically have for ABMs, for each parameter assumption about each combination of, of, of parameter values that you're assuming, each parameter vector each unambiguous statement parameters are this, there's still some variability in outcomes, right? There's still some variability because of stochastics in the model. Um, but secondly, I, I wanna go a bit deeper than this. You know, often our models have goals associated with them. Sometimes the goals involve projection. Sometimes the goals involve valuation. Sometimes the goals involve explanation for historical trends. Sometimes the goals involve evaluation of trade-offs between interventions. If you're dealing with the latter or the final of those, trade-offs between interventions, then um, you know, performance sensitivity analysis is valuable. You, you, you get some understanding about parameters which most impact model outcomes, perhaps, that you're interested in. But you can be fooled by sensitivity analysis um, into thinking that you're a lot more uncertain about trade-offs between interventions than you are. Because sometimes parameters that have high impact on model outcomes, that systematically change model outcomes a lot, do so without changing the 
the relative desirability of certain param of certain interventions. So you may have intervention A and intervention B. And maybe for the default value of the parameters, intervention A is secures more benefits than intervention B. And you may find as you vary parameters, the results of intervention A go way up and down on the one hand. And the results of intervention B go way up and down on the other. And you may say, well, how can we, how can we choose A or B? Because the results are so variable given the values of parameters. The, the results of these interventions are so variable, are so contingent on parameters. How can we, how can we be so sure about their trade-offs? But the, the insight from these techniques, and we've contributed to this literature, is that sometimes you can have variations, you can have parameters that are to which the model is very sensitive in its outcomes, but they change both the parameters in comparable ways. And so maybe as you change those parameters, it raises the benefits of A and the benefits of B, but it leaves their relative value similar. A is still more favorable than B. And as you change the parameters in other ways, it lowers both, but A is still better than B. There's still that regularity. Maybe it draws them a bit closer together, makes one more, you know, hugely better than, than the other, but maybe it retains the clear valuation between them. This is quite possible. And so often it is desirable to, to remember your model goals when you're performing model sensitivity analysis, not, not just to view it as an input-output relationship between parameters and outcomes and how, how sensitive it is to you know, changing, tweaking those parameters, but to ask how much does it matter to the things we really care about? Um, and in many models, those are you know, interventions. Um, uh, a third, thing I'm, I'll just leave you with for thinking, and again, we'll come back to it next time, is that it won't be long before we turn to the topic of calibration, okay? And in calibration, we, we can view calibration as one of these processes that has a cognate role to sensitivity analysis in the sense that it's dealing with uncertainty about parameters. It's trying to remedy in a constructive way uncertainty about parameters. It's trying to fill in the blanks, as it were. Trying to give us estimate, reasonable estimates, grounded estimates, informed estimates about the values of parameters that we don't know well. Um, and often that accompanies the desire for sensitivity analysis because we, we're interested in knowing how contingent our results are, particularly with respect to things that whose value we don't we don't really know. But there's a very interesting question, and I'll, I'll post the slides here, and you can muse on it, on how these two interact. To what degree do you do sensitivity before calibration to inform the choice of parameters to calibrate? Or to what degree do you perform a, analysis, a sensitivity analysis after calibration to understand in the calibrated model, how sensitive is it to different outcomes? Or to what degree do you try to weave them together? And there's some interesting techniques um, that our group has made use of in conjunction with other researchers that, that do try to explore this linkage between calibration and sensitivity more fully. These two ways of grappling with uncertainty about about parameter values as a, as a key part. Um, so we're not gonna um, deal with that exhaustively, but it is a topic that I'll speak about next time. And we'll, we'll talk about some trade-offs um, associated with this. Okay, um, so that's all we have time for today. I um, have this grant proposal, which uh, uh, is going to turn into a pumpkin unless I can get it in by the, the strike of a clock at the end of this hour. So um, with your leave, I am going to uh, repair to my office and um, proceed to submission. Um, I actually have to make a tweak on it uh, before that. 
And uh, I will look forward to seeing people on Thursday. Thank you very much.